Welcome to the podcasts of discovergreece.com, where we give you all the travel inspiration you need to dream about and plan your next trip to Greece. Our podcasts are designed to add even greater depth and color to your holidays. We explore local traditions and culture, bring museums and archaeological sites to life, and we go to the source of the Mediterranean food and drink we all love so much. Most of all, we look for the stories of the people behind the travel experience. Think of our podcasts as a first glimpse of the memories you'll be taking home when you visit. We are in Corfu Old Town, which has been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And as soon as you start exploring, it's easy to see why. Corfu didn't experience Ottoman rule in the way that most of the rest of Greece did. But it did experience a succession of Western conquerors who ruled or governed the island from the 11th to the 19th century. And of these, the ones who influenced Corfu most were the Venetians, the French and the British, from whom it inherited many of the unique cultural attractions that we can admire today. Our episode today finds us on the north side of the Venetian Spianada Square, close to pedestrianized Liston, built by the French to resemble the Rue de Rivoli in Paris, and inside the majestic palace of St. Michael and St. George, built by the British between 1819 and 1823. This was the time of the British protectorate of the Ionian Islands, and the palace was the official residence of the British Lord High Commissioner of the time. The official reason for the construction of the palace was to become the seat of the headquarters of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, one of the most prestigious British honors awarded to those holding high position in Mediterranean territories, which was transferred to Corfu. It also housed the Ionian Senate and Parliament, which together defined the government of the Ionian state. None of that sounds like a scene that's typical of a Greek island. Then again, Corfu isn't a typical Greek island. So maybe you won't be that surprised to learn that close to a Venetian built square, alongside a Paris inspired street, and within a British palace, you'll find a museum of Asian art, the only museum of its kind in Greece. But before we get into details about the artifacts of Corfu's Museum of Asian Art, it's worth finding out what it's even doing in Corfu in the first place. The museum's official history begins in February 1928 when it opened its doors to the public as the Museum of Sino Japanese Art. It was a museum created to house the vast collection of Gregorios Manos, a former Greek ambassador to Vienna. In reality, however, the museum's origins go back many years before that, to when Manos first became fascinated by the art of Japan and envisioned sharing his passion with the rest of the world. Gregorios Manos was born in 1850 into a prominent family from Fanari in Constantinople. His family settled in Greece and, after his studies, he pursued a diplomatic career in Europe. This was a time when modern Europe was beginning to take shape. It was an era of breakthroughs that created new opportunities and wealth and new social habits. One of these social habits was the collection of exotic objects and works of art to be displayed in the grand residences of the time. Manos was bitten by the bug. He arrived in Vienna in 1892 to work at the Greek embassy there, and he found that familiarity with anything Japanese was considered a significant social credential. You might be wondering why. Well, by 1850, Trade relations between Europe and Japan had been re established after centuries of isolation, and in the years that followed, it became fashionable for European high society to attend exhibitions of Japanese art in the likes of Vienna, London, and Paris. So, from 1870 onwards, so called Japanism, the taste for Japanese art in decoration, was at its peak. This was the social context in which Mano's vision began to take shape. But not with the aim of establishing himself as a lover of the Far East. 
Instead, he saw himself as an art historian who wanted to share his knowledge with the general public. He began to collect Japanese artwork with a passion mainly from auctions in Paris. By 1900, when he became Greek ambassador to Austria, he owned hundreds of works of art. The trend of Japanism began to decline, but Manos continued to collect until 1919, by which time he had spent most of his fortune and decided to return to Greece. His collection was enormously valuable, something that France recognized. So Manos found himself under a lot of pressure from France, who wanted to buy the entire collection. Luckily for us, Manos decided to offer it to the Greek state in exchange for a small monthly stipend and the establishment of a museum of Sino Japanese art, where he would live and work as director for life. Several locations were considered, and the Palace of St. Michael and St. George in Corfu was found to be the ideal size and stature. The collection arrived in Corfu in 1924, and the donation to the Greek state was made the following year. The Sino Japanese Museum opened in February 1928, but sadly, Manos died four months later without ever seeing his life's dream come true. He had continued to collect until the year before his death, working tirelessly to classify and document the precious objects in his collection. By the end of his life, he had amassed some 9,500 objects, mainly from Japan, China, and Korea. The 6,500 objects from Japan, in particular, covered the wide range of Japanese art, including paintings, handcrafts, and woodblock prints. As well as textiles, military uniforms, and many ceramics. It was a collection of these 9,500 objects that were the first exhibits of the Sino Japanese Museum. But that was just the beginning when it came to donations to the museum. Other notable contributions followed, and the museum now has 15,000 works of Asian art to choose from. The donation of Nikolaos Hatzivasiliou. A diplomat who worked in Asia after the Second World War was also important, with some 380 works from India, Pakistan, Tibet, Siam, and Southeast Asia being added to the collection. And with these, the museum was renamed the Corfu Museum of Asian Art. Another donation followed from Harilaos Hiotakis, a refugee from Asia Minor who worked as a fur trader in the Netherlands. But whose passion was Chinese and Japanese art, and finally came the donation in 2001 from the Sarzetakis family in memory of their son, who had fallen in love with the art of Central Asia. So we've solved the mystery of what the Museum of Asian Art is doing on a Greek island in the Ionian Sea. Let's now take a closer look at this art. It's only right that we start our journey through Asia and Japan, where most of the exhibits come from. You'll find them on both the first and second floor of the museum, and as a collection, they offer a unique insight into Japanese art and culture. The point of this episode is to highlight some of the most special exhibits, but just as important is to give you the historical context that will help you understand. The value and importance of the entire Japanese art collection in the museum. In total, the collection numbers about 6,200 objects, mainly from the donations of Manos and Hatzivasiliou. It covers all periods of Japanese art from prehistoric times, in other words, from 10,500 BC, all the way up to the 19th century. Japan has always been one of the most important centers of civilization on the Asian continent, but the fact that it is next to China and Korea means that it has also been influenced by those countries, and all of this can be seen in the artwork of the museum. Let's start with religion. The indigenous religion of Japan, dating back to prehistoric times, was Shinto. It's a religion that involves supernatural beings called kami. Who are believed to inhabit all things, including elements of nature like wind and rain and physical objects such as trees and rivers. In the sixth century A.D., Buddhism began to spread to Japan. 
particularly Mahayana Buddhism, which was one of the two main branches of Buddhism and the main religion in China. As a result, the two religions coexist today, and in the museum we can find prehistoric figurines depicting Shinto deities and Buddhas and other sacred figures of the Edo period of Buddhism, one of the high points of Buddhist culture. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First of all, you may be wondering what the Edo period is. And that makes sense. In Japanese history, each period has a name derived from the regions or events that defined it. The Edo period is from 1600 to 1868, and it is named after the Bay of Edo, where Tokyo is today. It was the last period of traditional Japan, a time of internal peace, political stability, and economic growth. In other words, all the ingredients needed for Japanese art to flourish. As a result, many of the museum's exhibits are from this period. So, let's take a closer look at the Edo period and what made it what it was. Who were the people that played a key role in shaping this historic phase of Japanese history? The answer is the samurai. You've heard of them, of course, but here's your chance to get to know them a whole lot better. And to do that, we need to go back to centuries before the Edo period. The central imperial authority in Japan began to waver from the 10th century AD. Bloody battles broke out between the wealthy feudal lords in the provinces and the imperial power. And, as a result, the feudal lords formed private armies to protect their lands. These were the samurai. From the 12th century, samurai warriors, known as bushi, served their military commanders with loyalty, and they gained increasing administrative and economic power. The samurai were also distinguished by their special code of honor, bushido which required blind obedience to their lord and governed their behavior in times of peace and war. During the Momoyama period, the time just before Edo, the samurai built mansions and castles and invited famous artists to decorate them in order to demonstrate their economic and social power. By 1600, the emperor was forced to recognize the samurai's right to military administration and so began the Edo period. This new military government moved the country's administrative center to the Bay of Edo, while the emperor remained isolated within his court in Kyoto, the capital of Japan to that point. These changes led a large part of the country's population to settle in Edo. A new economically prosperous urban class was created, and that population soon began to play a dominant role in shaping social, artistic, and economic production. Among the museum's exhibits are samurai armor from the Edo period and a katana blade, the sword that held a special place in the life of a samurai, symbolizing his physical strength and code of honor and accompanying him until death. In terms of religion, the samurai were followers of Mahayana Buddhism, the second predominant religion in Japan, and specifically the Zen school, which spread from China in the 12th century. During the same period, green tea also became popular in Japan. Zen Buddhist monks prepared and drank the tea in a manner defined by ritual movements. This was the forerunner of the famous Japanese tea ceremony known as Chad, or the Way of the Tea. During the Middle Ages, from the 12th to the 16th century, green tea drinking and the tea ceremony became widespread in the samurai ranks and then spread to the rest of Japan's social classes. Traditionally, the ceremony was held in a specially designed room in the Japanese garden, the chasiju. In the museum, you can admire ceramic vessels and utensils used in the tea ceremony from medieval and Edo times. There is even a special room that recreates the atmosphere of a Japanese tea room with original furniture. So let's now have a closer look at the artwork that defined the Edo period. As urban life flourished in Edo, so did entertainment. 
and one of the main forms of entertainment was attending a performance in the traditional Japanese style of Nogaku theater. It's a style that incorporates masks, costumes, and various props into a performance built around dance and music. The themes are often based on tales from traditional literature, and today it is an art form that is included in the UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage. Nogaku theater began around the 14th century AD and consists of two categories, no and kyogen theatrical styles which are performed alternately on the same stage on the same day. No theater is a kind of symbolic drama. It draws its themes from history and classical literature. And its characteristic feature is that most of the leading roles require the use of a mask that allows the actors to express different emotional states on stage. As you can imagine, the craft of making these masks was an art form in itself. It took a mastery of woodworking and carving to bring expression to these masks. And the no masks in Corfu's Museum of Asian Art are wonderful examples of this craft. No two masks are alike, as each character has its own form. There are over 60 different types of no masks, covering male and female roles and different ages and emotional states. The goal of an actor was to bring their mask to life through a combination of movement, music, and costume. And the early costumes incorporated elements from the everyday dress of the nobility and the samurai. During the Edo period, costumes were made mainly of silk and had a combination of colorful patterns and rich decoration. In the museum, you'll find no theater costumes made of silk from the Edo period and impressive masks depicting a devilish spirit, a fox, and a young woman. Let's now move on to the second category of traditional Japanese theater, the Kiyogen theater. Kiyogen is essentially satire, and its primary aim is to provoke laughter from the audience. The subject matter is derived from folk tales and the daily lives of ordinary people in a feudal society. The faces of most of the characters are typically not covered by masks. So here, in the museum, we find a smaller variety of masks, ones depicting old men, demons and deities, as well animal and plant spirits. Apart from the theater, another form of entertainment for Edo's new urban class was nighttime visits to a geisha. You'll know a few things about geishas from movies, books and photographs but you're probably about to find out that you didn't know so much about them after all. In Japanese, gei means art and sha means person, and a geisha is first and foremost an artist, a calligrapher, a poet, a musician and a dancer. At the same time, however, a geisha was meant to entertain rich and powerful men who wanted beauty, grace, elegance and culture but not necessarily physical gratification. The first geishas appeared in the early 17th century in the so-called pleasure districts of Kyoto, Osaka and Edo. In the early years, they were men in disguise and played more of a comic role. But later, from the 18th century onwards, the profession took on a more artistic form and was practiced only by women. Geishas reached the height of their fame in the second half of the 19th century and in the early 20th century. Some geishas, Mikaito Ichimaru is perhaps the best known, even became famous outside Japan. In the past, some girls from poor families were sold to geisha houses. Gradually, however, this practice was abandoned and girls were free to choose whether or not to enter the profession. Traditionally, a geisha began her education at a very young age. This involved several stages. For example, she was trained in music, dance, singing, literature, poetry, calligraphy, flower arranging, and of course, the tea ceremony. Grooming was even a rite of passage for geishas as they followed a specific hair care routine and they still tie their hair in a traditional bun and adorn it with combs and other accessories. Makeup includes a thick layer of white foundation on the face, red and black shadow around the eyes and eyebrows, 
and red color on the lips. The basic element of their dress is the kimono, the luxury of which reflects the class and wealth of each geisha. Her waist is bound by a belt that ties at the back, an all-important feature as this was how geishas were distinguished from prostitutes who tied their belt at the front. Finally, wooden sandals complete the geisha's outfit. It is important to note, with the role of women in Japanese society downgraded, becoming a geisha was the only way for a woman to gain a different status. As a geisha, a woman gained education and culture as well as social recognition. She socialized with high officials and often learned state secrets. When she reached the upper ranks, she took on the role of teacher and head of the geisha house, enjoying financial independence and special respect. Officially, geishas were forbidden from having sexual relations with clients. In the past, however, the ritual delivery of an apprentice geisha's virginity to her wealthy patron was part of her role. Today, of course, adult geishas are free to choose their sexual partner. Knowing all of this, the museum exhibits of geisha hair grooming tools and combs, and the woodcuts depicting geishas will take on extra special meaning. Beyond entertainment, the people of Edo developed an appreciation of crafts especially ceramics. Korean potters settled in Japan in the late 16th and early 17th century, and demand grew for ceramics used in the tea ceremony and for household items of Edo's growing urban class. But the art that flourished most in Japan was painting. Corfu's Museum of Asian Art has a collection of around 200 works of Japanese painting, including hanging scrolls, reading scrolls, folding screens, albums, and painted fans, as well as a very large collection of ukiyo-e woodcuts dating from the 17th to the 19th century. Let's have a closer look at some of these works, starting with the folding screens. You'll probably already have an image in your head of what these look like. We are talking about the traditional Japanese partitions that created individual spaces for writing, reading, private meetings, household chores, the tea ceremony, festive events, that sort of thing. Edo period screens carried representations of landscapes, animals and plants, and images depicting the four seasons. At the museum, you have the opportunity to admire a six-leaf screen depicting wild horses. It is an exact replica of a screen at Edo Castle. The hanging scrolls, on the other hand, were purely decorative. As you'll imagine from their name, they were paintings wrapped around rollers with silk borders that unfolded on a flexible base and rested vertically on the wall. In the early years, their subject matter was associated with the seasons of the year or with events occurring in the room they were decorating. Later, however, The themes included mainly landscapes, flowers, birds, portraits, and even verses of poetry. The Edo period scrolls in the museum are painted on paper or silk. The most impressive part is that the museum has scrolls of the Kano School, which was one of Japan's most important schools of painting. It was characterized by vibrant colors spread across flat surfaces, with a brilliant background of gold leaf that reflected light. The samurai also had a hand in this when they invited famous artists to decorate their mansions, including the most important representative of the school, Kano Eitoku. The reading scrolls, on the other hand, were unrolled sideways from right to left. They were horizontal compositions or calligraphy gradually revealed as the scroll unraveled. They were kept rolled up and were only opened for reading. The albums contained painted pages, originally single pages that were later bound. This composition was mainly done by artists or collectors. Finally, among the items that will catch your eye are the fans. Japanese fans are hinged and made of folded paper or silk attached to a semicircle of bamboo rods. 
the most striking fan in the museum, depicts two actors, a man and a woman, and stands out because it is the work of the artist Toshushai Saraku. Sharaku was one of the most important Japanese artists of the traditional art of woodblock printmaking in the ukiyo-e technique. More about that in a moment. Sharaku was a mysterious figure who was active for a brief period in the 18th century. All of his works were of exceptional care and technique and represented actors of the popular theater rather than the refined no theater. Through the characters that he painted, Sharaku realistically portrayed the darker aspects of man, including narcissism, vanity, and dark passions. In his time, he was harshly criticized by the community of Edo. It is possible that the realism in his work and his obsession with human characteristics created embarrassment for customers, making his work difficult to sell. The art critics of the time were unrelenting in their criticism. Under pressure from all sides, it is believed that he was forced to retire. Western collectors discovered him in the late 19th century, when the value of his work was fully recognized. His original works are hard to find today. A Japanese professor who visited the museum and came across a Saraku fan that was unknown in Japan couldn't hide his astonishment. But what was this ukiyo-e style in which Saraku excelled? Unlike the luxurious style of the Kano school that the samurai prized when decorating their mansions, ukiyo-e woodblock prints were aimed at the emerging but not yet established urban class. This emerging status led to them being described as a flowing urban class. This is why they were called images of the flowing world. In the beginning, The name ukiyo-e, meaning flowing world, was associated with the Buddhist concept of the ephemeral nature of human existence. However, from the 17th to the 19th century, it came to denote the hedonistic approach of the present, in other words, the latest fashion trends and the search for elegance in the daily lives of the growing Edo urban class. As woodblock prints, the artist's works could be reproduced many times. This made them more affordable and accessible to the general public. At the same time, because they were aimed at the urban class, the works often focused on the activities of ordinary people, which, for the first time, became the subject of artwork. In this way, it was artwork that characterized the Edo period, and it flourished. The museum has a particularly important collection of 1,200 Japanese woodblock prints purchased by Gregorios Manos at art auctions in Paris and Vienna in the late 19th and early 20th century. This brings us to the end of our journey through Japan, but the journey through Asia continues. Our next collection at Corfu's Museum of Asian Art is from South and Southeast Asia. These are works from India, Gandhara, Siam, and Cambodia, as well as Nepal and Tibet. They are mainly religious figurines made of stone, gilded brass with precious stones and wood, and ritual banners. Examples include the religious figures from the three main religions of India, Hinduism, covering 80% of the population, Jainism, and Buddhism. You'll also see how Alexander the Great's expedition through the Indian subcontinent 2,300 years ago influenced local art. Hellenistic elements were incorporated into the artwork, including Buddha figurines from ancient Gandhara. At the time of Alexander the Great, Gandhara, now northern Pakistan, was a province of India. And from the 1st to the 6th century AD, an interesting style developed there which became established as the Helena-Buddhist art of Gandhara. From here, you move on to other Buddha figurines from Cambodia, Siam, which is now Thailand, Nepal and Tibet. And you can see how the features change between the different nationalities. And with this, we come to one of the world's oldest civilizations, China.
the Chinese collection of the Museum of Asian Art comprises some 3,500 objects. It covers a period of 30 centuries, which unfold through ceramic, porcelain, and brass work, as well as sculptures, enamels, lacquer, and ivory objects, small crafts, clothing, jewelry, and coins. China covers a vast geographically diverse area, and its history is one of ruling dynasties. And it's the names of these dynasties that define a particular period of Chinese culture. So, to understand the ceramics and other works on display in the museum, and especially their evolution, we first need to learn a thing or two about the dynasties in which they were made. Our journey into the art of China begins as early as the Neolithic era. Each community at the time developed its own pottery techniques to create vessels that were used, among other things, as food containers that were buried with the dead. Then, from 2000 to 1050 BC, comes the Bronze Age with the Tia and Shang dynasties. During this period, metalworking and ceramics played a dominant role. The Shang dynasty metal workers developed a variety of sophisticated ways of treating bronze to make weapons and utensils. The dominant expression of Chinese art was through idiomorphic bronze devotional vessels. These vessels were used mainly by the Chinese aristocracy and their size and luxury signified the social status of their owner. They were made from molds of various shapes and sizes and featured engraved and embossed decoration. Next came the Zhu dynasty, which lasted until 221 BC. This was the dynasty of the first Chinese philosophers, like Confucius and Lao Tzu. Its art shows both similarities and differences, especially in decoration, to the art of the Shang dynasty. Initially, bronze devotional vessels were produced probably by the same craftsmen who had served the Shang dynasty. Their inscriptions indicate that they were used as food and wine vessels. They were used as offerings to the dead in the hope that they would bring the living into contact with their spirits. At the same time, these ritual vessels were seen as carriers of written texts, and so they became heirlooms passed down from generation to generation. We move on to red and earth-colored clay burial objects from the Qin and Han dynasty. These dynasties lasted from 221 BC to 220 AD and was one of the golden ages of Chinese history. It was the beginning of the unification of the state, the construction of the Great Wall and the creation of the Silk Road which brought a boom to China's trade relations as well as new ideas such as Buddhism. There followed a turbulent period in Chinese history with another six dynasties unfolding before we reach another golden period between 589 to 907 AD, which were the years of the Sui and Tang dynasties. During this time, China became the strongest and richest empire in the then-known world. As its empire expanded, so did its trade routes, and with trade came new ideas. The economy developed, there was religious tolerance, and visiting merchants brought valuable objects from other cultures. Foreigners also settled in the cities, bringing with them their language, religion, and customs. Chinese craftsmen began to follow Indian styles in creating sculptures and potters made glazed ceramic imitations of luxury objects from other countries. At the same time, exporting ceramic utensils flourished to India, the Middle East and Africa, while the development of the textile industry led to the export of high-quality silk fabrics. And wooden printing plates led to the spread of typography. In terms of ceramics, this is the time when the famous Chinese vases made of pure white porcelain and China's famous three-colored enamel decoration, appeared. The five dynasties and the Liao, Song, and Jin dynasties followed up to 1279. This included another turbulent period in China, which was split into different dynasties until being reunited under the Song dynasty. As a result, 
the country was led into relative isolation. But that didn't stop impressive economic and artistic growth. Sculpture, ceramics, and painting in particular approached a level of near perfection as did silk work. This is when porcelain production was established and various types of vase with characteristic decoration and colored glazes appeared. Within these was the famous Celadon porcelain, which was glazed in a jade green color and often had an intentional cracked-like pattern and floral decorations. Yellow base porcelains with embossed and painted chestnut-colored decorations also appeared. This type of porcelain was also found in the next dynasty, the Yuan dynasty, which began in the mid-13th century and continued until 1368. It is a dynasty that started when the Mongols invaded China from the north, searching for natural resources and abundant labor. This is when techniques developed to bring in new monochrome glazes and when Persian influences brought in the first blue and white porcelains. And so we come to the overthrow of the Mongols and perhaps the most famous dynasty in terms of its porcelain, the long-standing Ming dynasty, which lasted from 1368 to 1644. The capital of China moved to Beijing, where the Forbidden City was being built. The Forbidden City is today the best-preserved monument of Chinese traditional architecture, with a characteristic red wooden skeleton of the buildings and the yellow glazed tiles. It also constitutes the biggest unchanged building complex in the world, numbering about 800 buildings with 9,000 rooms. It was called the Forbidden City because it was forbidden for commoners to enter without special permission. It was the center of administration and the private residence of the 24 emperors of the Ming and subsequent Qing dynasties that followed. In 1925, it was converted into a museum, which today exhibits some of the most important examples of Chinese art. The Ming period was undoubtedly a time of cultural prosperity. China never regained the territory it had under the Tang dynasty, and certainly not the cosmopolitan character of that period. But living standards did improve, and with those improvements, art and technology experienced a new period of prosperity. The production of Ming ceramics flourished in the imperial workshops. Porcelains of unique shape material and decoration, both monochrome and multicolored, were made. And you could also find works influenced by Persian art and in colorful glazes. As different colors or color groups appeared, Chinese ceramics were classified into groups according to these colors. Typical color groups in Ming porcelains are combinations of white and blue, green, red, yellow and ash and a three-colored glaze combining dark purple, green, yellow, or turquoise. This is how we arrive in China's last dynasty, the Qing dynasty. It started in 1644 and lasted all the way to 1912. The remarkable thing here is that many of the Qing emperors were personally involved in painting and art criticism themselves. In fact, many are considered famous artists and collectors by Chinese art historians. The ceramic works of the early phase of the Qing dynasty are considered unique pieces and are prized by collectors around the world. For all that, Qing art largely imitated Song and Ming art, and especially from the mid-18th century onwards. It also displayed European influences due to the many European commissions for artwork but it was also characterized by the appearance of many new colors in porcelains, from which new color families were created, such as dark red, black, and camellia jade green, as well as imperial yellow. This brings us to the end of our colorful journey through the dynasties of China, where we've seen how Chinese artwork, and specifically ceramics and porcelain, developed over time. But before we say goodbye, We've got one final treat in store as we give you a sneak peek of the museum's collection of the nomads of Central Asia. (music) 
Central Asia stretches from the Caspian Sea to China and from Afghanistan to Russia. It is a region with indistinguishable borders but defined by two main components, the stopover cities of the mythical Silk Road and the nomadic character of its tribes. Today, it broadly encompasses the five republics of the former Soviet Union, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. Corfu's Museum of Asian Art includes a collection of about 200 objects from the 19th century, all donated by the Sarzetakis family. Here, you will admire art with brilliant colors and repeating patterns, reflecting the Eastern worldview of the successive cycles of life, death and rebirth. To understand how valuable and rare this collection is, you only have to consider that the nomads of Central Asia made these objects to meet their daily needs. In other words, they wouldn't have considered them valuable enough to preserve. Instead, they were everyday items, used until they were broken or thrown away. At the same time, due to the often borderless life of nomads, such collections are incredibly rare. Among the exhibits you will admire in the museum are handmade carpets and kilims, which are tapestry-woven rugs of the Baluch people or their neighboring tribes, who were also considered master weavers. Who are the Baluch, you ask? In travelogues and ethnological studies, the Baluch are described as nomadic animal farmers who live and move under difficult conditions. A Greek doctor and explorer who met the Baluch during his tour of Asia from 1867 to 1872 famously described them as tribes with successive divisions who lived in the lowlands during the summer and moved to areas with low vegetation and water during the rainy season. They resembled in appearance and dress a mix of Iranians, Indians and Afghans. They have also been described as bandits. At the same time, however, they are known for a strong sense of hospitality that included laying down carpets to welcome strangers who approached their tents. The Baluch weavings you can admire in the museum are the creations of women. The decoration consists of geometric triangles, hexagons, octagons, rosettes, plants and flowers, as well as human figures or animals in successive rows. And the dominant colors are blue, black, red, maroon, brown and white. Finally, there are the other nomadic artifacts, such as silk garments, handmade embroidery, jewelry, and Indo-Greek coins. And there is a collection of 19th century European newspapers and a number of scientific publications and journals with illustrations and articles about the nomads of Central Asia. And that's it! Our artistic journey around Asia is complete. Your time in a British palace, on an Ionian island, in the only museum in Greece dedicated exclusively to Asian art, has come to an end. This is where we say goodbye and hope that you enjoyed this episode of DiscoverGreece.com's podcasts. If you want to hear more stories from around Greece, Follow us on Spotify, Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. See you soon.